called the unbelievable story. And uh, it's not the unprovable story. It's the unbelievable story. Stories are so important to who we are. I don't know, and I can't answer the question, what is my story, until I understand the story to which I belong. And there are a lot of us who don't know where our story belongs. We don't know where our story fits in the world and does our story even have any meaning? I loved watching the videos. So many people talk about that, that flip piece of finding purpose and significance. We, we come into this space of, of the unbelievable story and Sometimes what makes it unbelievable is it feels like it's just been told a long time ago. But did you know that, that old stories don't mean untrue stories? Did you ever have like a person in your life that could just tell a story? And as they started to tell the story, like they, they, could, I mean, they, were st- like they could weave you into a story. And there were like moments in that person's storytelling, you were like, can you really believe what this guy is talking about? There's no way he experienced that or, or, or she saw that. But as they tell the story, you're just like, did it really happen? Were you really there? Several years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Buzz was on that first moon landing mission. Some of you are going, yeah, right. He was in Hollywood. Buzz had just written an autobiography called Magnificent Desolation. It's the phrase that he was able to describe the moon with. The only words that he could come up with is it was magnificent and it was desolate. And when he he landed back on earth, he, he talked about his life was so shaken by what he had seen. He didn't know how to navigate everything else. Became a raging alcoholic. And magnificent desolation was his journey back to wholeness from alcoholism. A beautiful biography of struggle and and pain, but also of hope and healing. And we think about stories, and maybe you think about your own story, and you just kind of wonder where it fits in, and that's kind of the place. So what's the story that we anchor to? If I began the story with once upon a time, would you feel better, or would you feel less true today? Once upon a time. Or or maybe, 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 maybe I should start. in a galaxy far, far away (laughs) a long, long time ago. Maybe that would be better. Once upon a time, there was God. And in the middle of nothingness, God spoke, let there be light. And the light appeared. And it was good. And he would continue to speak. And by the time he had finished speaking, there was sun and moon and stars and planets and galaxies as far as we haven't even measured yet. And there was water and land and plants and trees and birds and fish and animals and people and microorganisms we haven't even discovered yet. And it was good. And then one day, one day the created thought it was better than the creator. And said, I want to live life differently and rejected everything that was good. And in that rejection, the universe broke. The whole universe broke. 
in Christian language, we call it sin, came into the world. And from that moment, the entire story changed. At least from our perspective. And the unbelievable story begins. Because as we interact with the story that once upon a time came with an answer to solve the problem of sin, destruction, brokenness, and death. And Jesus entered the world. We celebrate that as Christians week in and week out. Easter calls special attention to this. That Jesus came. Jesus didn't come out of curiosity. He wasn't trying to figure out the human condition. He didn't come as an investigative reporter to get some, some kind of inside scoop. God knows you already. The worst of you, God knows you. The Bible tells us, like, who can add a single moment of life by worrying because God knows every hair on your head. He named every star in the sky. He knows you. Every fiber of your being. The Hebrew song says that He wove you together in your mother's womb. He purposed you. And He saw you. Jesus didn't come out of curiosity. Jesus came on a rescue mission. For all of the pursuit of people, all of the sacrifice, all the we think we can be good enough stuff that we struggle with, it was never enough. And the secret of that story is that even today, it's still not enough. All of our striving, all the things that we think will make people love us, accept us, grab onto us, value us, it's exhausting, isn't it? But God, who is rich in mercy, sent His Son to interrupt the striving. Sent His Son to, to interrupt the hurry, the rush, the never-enoughness that we live under. And Jesus came into the world. And He came on a rescue mission. Jesus died on the cross. Sacrifice has long been an issue with sin. The Bible says so deeply, the wages of sin is death. So much so that we would see lambs and birds and other animals sacrificed on a regular basis to accommodate the brokenness of humanity. That wasn't just in a Judeo-Christian tradition. People all throughout history, all over the globe, have tried to appease some greater power by means of sacrifice. I remember walking through temples in India and watching people bring baskets of fruit and gifts and money and goods and textiles and laying them at statues' feet and begging these statues in their own language to move on their behalf. And the statues never flinched. But instead of trying to cause us to appease the situation, God said, I'll take care of it. Because all of the striving that you're doing will never be enough. So I'm going to do what is exactly enough. And Jesus came. And Jesus died. I love the words from 1 Corinthians. Paul says, let me remind you of the story we've heard from the very beginning. This good news, the gospel, that Jesus died according to the scriptures. He died. But three days later, he rose again. The tomb is empty. We have lived so long trying to grab on to the unprovable story, or maybe just the provable story. Maybe if we find bones, or maybe if we find this, or maybe if we find that. Well, what about the Shroud of Turin, and what about this, and what about that? That right in front of us, all the things that we think we have to prove, because we're a prove-it people,
oftentimes get in the way of what's right in front of our faces. The tomb has been empty for over 2,000 years. Three days after his death, the tomb was empty. Today, it's still empty. Jesus rose again. He died as sacrifice for sin. He rose again to invite us to life. That same Paul who talked about according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. He would continue that Jesus would be the firstborn of the resurrection. All throughout the Bible, people who believe in Jesus are considered children of God and brothers and sisters of each other. Because we're born of this life, this resurrected life by faith. I believe. The proof was in the tomb. It was empty. What happened? Where did it go? The story doesn't end there. Could you imagine? Like if, if that was the story, it would be fine. But Jesus actually in front of five hundred witnesses ascends back into heaven telling us he's going to come again everything that jesus did leading up to his death burial and resurrection led to language of this isn't over yet the work is complete but it's not fulfilled there's more to come and just like dessert today the best is yet to come <laughs> like, like some of you right now may be thinking about man is my ham going to be okay when i get home don't worry about the ham. Nobody really likes ham, right? What, like you serve ham because it looks pretty on the plate, looks pretty when it comes out. But what people are really waiting for is dessert. And then what's going to happen is today some people are going to mess around and they're going to serve pudding with nothing in it. And you're going to tell the person next to you, we'll get you a spoon. Do you know how disappointing a spoon can be at dessert time? Like personally, I like ice cream. My favorite is milkshakes in particular. Whichever flavor, I don't care. My wife and I got into a huge conversation the other day, like this great theological debate. How many milkshakes do you drink in a month? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. She says, four, five, I don't know. How many should I drink? She's like, I want two a year. To a year, you're a heretic. <laughs> How do you even do that? So if you said, here's a straw, I might get really excited at dessert today. The spoon. Ice cream in a bowl is okay. Corey makes a great banana pudding. But when someone tells you to keep your fork... Hold on to your fork. <laughs> oh, man, you start salivating again. You're like, yeah. Keep your fork. <laughs> Keep your fork. Like Jesus returned to heaven, and one day we're going to be with him. Some days I wish that day was today. I, I kind of like being on earth. Don't get me wrong. I kind of like the idea. Even with its broken mess, I kind of like the earth. I like, you know, all the things that we see. I like rainbows. I like waterfalls. I like mountaintops. Like we were looking at pictures of the Tetons yesterday. I don't know if you have ever just seen a picture of the Grand Tetons out west. It may be the most magnificent looking mountain range ever like perfectly peaked. And the lake that's in front of it, the way it just mirrors the, the, the sky back and, and the, the range back, the Tetons are absolutely beautiful. But you know, one day the Tetons are going to be redeemed also? Because Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. All of creation will be restored. And we talk about being taken to heaven, but heaven is that space. God never separates heaven from earth. Ever. 
So when we talk about being taken to heaven, we really talk about being taken into a space where there is no more sorrow, no more shame, no more guilt, no more suffering, no more death. In heaven, that place where God is and we get to be, that's going to interact with a restored and renewed earth, is all that we can say, heaven, because we don't know what it's like to live without sin and shame and suffering and guilt and death. And that piece almost feels unbelievable, right? Because what we know to be true is something that's broken and hurt. But ultimately, ultimately, we live eternally with God. We're told so often that, that the earth will pass away. I mean, we've gone through a season in our own family over the last several weeks where every week we are mourning with someone because... Um, Another person close in our circle or close to the people that are close to us has died, and this week was no different in that. I mean, you were in a day like, like it was awesome that yesterday was like the first 60 degree day here in Minnesota in, in like five months, and it was awesome. But you know what happens when all the snow and ice melts? It reveals all the brokenness of the road. <laughs> Some of you are looking for a road map to get out of the potholes that your cars get stuck, stuck in. And how do you move through that, you know? But it's just, this, it rem- reminded of this, this broken creation because everything passes away. Everything fades. And, and the idea, the whole concept of eternity, like how do you possible like, get that into your head to go, this is real? The whole message feels Unbelievable. And yet, throughout the, the entire course of, of at least Christian history, this is the message that has been proclaimed. But it's the same message that was proclaimed from the beginning before sin ever entered the world. But there is God, and He is love, and He is true, and He holds everything together in spite of or despite the things that don't want to be held together. He holds everything together. And he's always provided. And I sometimes think it's not the good news of God that Jesus came, that he lived and died and rose again, and that he's going to make all things new. That, to me, sometimes doesn't feel like it's the unbelievable story. What makes me feel like it's the unbelievable story is that place that God says it's about you. Like the moment that God turns the story away from him and right to you is where things get really unbelievable. Because we start to ask the questions, can God really love me? Does God really love me? With all the things that happen around me, does God love me? And we use the the brokenness of a world that's around us as proof that that love is unbelievable. We use the feelings of our own person to create echoes and shadows of doubt that the story must not be true. And it's not our feelings that dictate what's true. Truth tells truth. If you think just for a minute, of you at your absolutely worst place ever. In that space, when you think about it, do you know that God loves you there? But that He looks at that and says, in spite of your worst, I love you? Like the unbelievable part of the story isn't what God did 2,000 years ago. The unbelievable part is what God wants to do in your life right now, today. That He wants to hold you, 
keep you, sustain you, forgive you, restore you, love you, embolden you, empower you, equip you, purpose you. See, you believe sometimes that you're through with yourself and God continues to tell you, I haven't even started the project yet. I'm waiting on you. And he invites us, never forces us. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? We are told over and over that this good news story, this gospel, is the power of God at work in us. Do you believe it? Easter isn't a celebration of what everybody else believes. Easter is a challenge of what do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe that you are so deeply loved and desired by God? that he would give everything that was rightfully his through his son to make everything that you could never do right with him? Do you believe that God tells you to stop trying and start living because life is found in Jesus? Do you believe that there is hope and renewal for you, for me, See, Easter isn't about what everybody else believes. Ultimately, Easter is about what God has already told us, but the invitation for you to live into the story. Where is your place in the story? I cannot know what the answer is, what's my story, until I know the answer to the question, where does my story belong? And you belong in God's story. You are so loved, so deeply wanted, so deeply invited. Will you believe it?